Okay, so in the interest of time, we're going to get started now. Happy Friday, everyone. My name is Tony Mathias, and I'm the marketing manager for the criminal justice list at Oxford University Press. As a department of Oxford University and as a not-for-profit higher education publisher, Oxford University Press is uniquely situated to offer the highest scholarship at the best possible prices in print and digital format. I want to thank everyone today for joining us, and I also want to thank Dr. Stephen Owen and Dr. Todd Burke for joining us today. Dr. Stephen Owen is a professor and chair of the Criminal Justice Department at Radford University in Radford, Virginia. Dr. Owen's research interests include criminal justice education, criminal justice policy issues, and interpersonal violence. He regularly teaches a variety of courses in areas including emergency management, environmental criminology, and criminal justice policy. In 2010, he received the Radford University Foundation Distinguished Service Award, and in 2012, he received the Radford University Foundation Distinguished Creative Scholar Award. While scholarship and service are significant areas for Dr. Owen's focus, his primary passion lies in structuring meaningful learning activities for students in his courses. Dr. Burke is a professor of criminal justice and currently serves as the Associate Dean for the College of Humanities and Behavioral Science at Radford University. He is also, the form, he is also a former Maryland police officer. His research in, interests include criminal justice pedagogy, school campus violence, domestic violence, serial and mass murders, and critical issues in policing and forensic studies. Dr. Burke was the 2012 recipient of the Radford University Distinguished Service Award, and in 2014, he was the recipient of the College of Humanities and Behavioral Sciences Distinguished Scholar Award. Dr. Burke is a regular commentator on criminal justice issues for many national and local media outlets. Both are co-authors, along with Dr. Hank uh, Fredella and Dr. Jerry Joplin, of Oxford University Press's second edition of Foundations of Criminal Justice. Before we get started, I'm going to mute everyone on the line except for Stephen and Todd so we don't have any issues with background noise. At the end of the session, we'll have a question and answer session. So please type your questions in the question box on the webinar control panel. At the end of the presentation, Stephen and Todd will answer as many questions as they can in the time allotted. Both authors have graciously agreed to answer any questions we don't get to online. And so without further ado, we're going to kick things off. So over to you, Stephen and Todd. Okay, well, thank you, Tony. We appreciate the introduction and uh, thank those of you who have uh, joined us this afternoon to discuss student engagement through problem-based learning in criminal justice. Uh, as Tony said, I'm Steve Owen. I'm the uh, Chair of the Criminal Justice Department at Radford University and have been using problem-based learning in a number of classes uh, for several years now. And I'm Todd Burke, and once again, as Tony has said, uh, I'm a professor of criminal justice at Radford University and currently serving as the associate dean. So even though I have a, a foot on the dark side, I, my still real passion is, is in the classroom. What we're going to do next, we're going to kind of, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, and he's going to talk about uh, the concept of problem-based learning. Thanks, Todd. So in looking at what problem-based learning is all about, uh, we want to note that the origins of problem-based learning actually came from the field of medicine. As medical schools considered how to better treat, uh, or I'm sorry, how to better teach future doctors, they discovered that the problem-based model was more effective than some of their more traditional pedagogical approaches. So what I'd like to do is compare pair problem-based learning to more traditional models of learning and teaching and try to draw out some of the key distinctions. Really, when thinking about problem-based learning, it's a distinction between deductive versus inductive pedagogical techniques. The diagram that's currently on the screen is for traditional pedagogical approaches, and these follow a deductive model in which students are presented with a general set of theories or a general set of ideas and then are asked to specifically apply them to a case or a scenario. As an example of traditional education, students may be told, here's a key theoretical concept. For instance, here's 
a key theory about how sentencing structures are established in the court system. And then given a problem to address or given a scenario to address using the information that they've just learned. So again, it's a very deductive process where students are given the concept, then told, now go out and apply it. Problem-based learning flips this idea on its head and starts with the application and then ultimately builds to an understanding of the theory or the concept. In other words, problem-based learning is a very inductive approach where students are given a problem without prior instruction of the theories that underlie it. In fact, in problem-based learning, the more complex the issue or the messier the issue, the better it is for students to grapple with. Again, going back to the medical school model, under the traditional approach, students would be told, here are symptoms of 10 different diseases. Now here's a patient. What do you think they have? Under the problem-based approach, they would simply be given a case, saying, here's a patient who has just entered your clinic. Diagnose this patient and do a workup. The students would then be responsible for identifying what the actual problem is, doing their own research and their own creative thinking to determine what the best solution to that problem is. This is beneficial because while it provides more challenge to students, that challenge empowers them to do more critical thinking and to approach problems with a greater flexibility, empowering students to discover principles which then, in fact, aid in the retention and understanding of material. Because rather than simply having a rote application, students are instead learning, discovering, and having a very memorable process, which then at the end of that, the instructor can come in and tie things together and say, now see, here's how what you've just done fits a theoretical understanding that's key to the field, reinforcing what the students have just done. So what we'd like to do now is talk about how this model of problem-based learning, an inductive approach beginning with a problem or an application, then leading to the development of theory, how this can be used in criminal justice and some examples that we've found successful in our courses. So the focus of this slide is to identify several types of techniques that can be used to set up a problem-based learning scenario. One is to have, as the name suggests, brief problem-solving scenarios where students are given maybe a paragraph to a page outlining a problem and being told to develop a solution or a resolution to the scenario that's posed within it. Again, from that, the instructor would then help students tease out the lessons learned after the students had already worked through and arrived at their own tentative conclusions. One way of accomplishing this is through role playing. Well, what do we mean by role playing? Well, Steve and I, and of course many others, uh, we place the students in the role as a professional practitioner. For example, a police officer, criminal investigator, corrections officer, uh, judges. So what, whatever you can possibly think of as a professional practitioner. And we present the students with situations that need to be resolved. Another possibility is the use of the case method. The case method involves providing students with an actual scenario that really happened. Cases are difficult to write, but a good case can have a lot of teaching power. We often think of cases from a legal perspective, but this certainly goes beyond that and can touch on any aspect of criminal justice. Any instance where a criminal justice decision maker has had to process a decision and to justify that decision can function as a case. So any high-profile decision that's been made by any agency can be described, and then students go through that, read, and understand what the player in that case actually was trying to accomplish, what the agency was actually trying to accomplish, look at the way that they were going about it, and then be posed a question at the end about what could have been done better, what they would have done differently. Uh, how the case could have been resolved other than the actual resolution that emerged. Cases are particularly powerful, really, when they're exploring a decision that went wrong, when they're exploring a scenario in which the ideal decision was not made, and students can be challenged to think about what could be done better. 
So what really problem-based learning is all about, it's a method that emphasizes creativity. I mean, these can promote valuable skills such as critical thinking, written communication, or at oral communication. Well, I guess it all depends on how the scenarios are processed. So what we're going to do in the next uh, couple of slides is we're going to look at some examples and across the areas of policing, court, corrections, crime theory, and law. We're going to start off with uh, a policing scenario. And I'm not sure if the, the PowerPoint slides are working effectively, because um, I don't have that in front of me. So what, what's going to happen is we're going to use policing as the, the first kind of example. So I'll read you the scenario. And again, normally I wouldn't read you uh, a scenario, but I'm not sure what's showing up on your screen or not. So here's what, the type of situation that we would do. We say, you're a police supervisor. Your area has experienced an increase in the number of breaking and entering. In the past two months, there have been 28 cases in your suburban district. The mayor has received complaints and has directed the chief to fix the situation, and the chief has now passed the buck to you. So note, by the way, how this matches the definition that Steve had just talked about. We start with a scenario requiring an application of some critical thinking, then in the process of the scenario, a larger theoretical understanding tends to emerge. So what we're asking the students is, what is the problem? What are some possible causes? What are solutions related to the causes? And how would you determine if these solutions work? Just as an editor, for those of you who do teach uh, policing, I strongly recommend the Center for Problem-Oriented Policing. They have some really cool uh, electronic modules that can really uh, be proved beneficial in this type of uh, situation, scenarios. But what we do is we get the students are given time to work through this as an example. Then what we do is, since we have just mentioned problem-oriented policing, now we talk about problem-oriented policing. And the students learn the SARA principle. Some of you may be familiar with scanning, analysis, response, and assessment, uh, where scanning is the, you know, is this really a problem? Have we really identified the problem? Analysis is looking at how have other police agencies dealt with this problem? You know, this is breaking and entering, and you know, we're not reinventing the wheel here, so how have other agencies dealt with it? Response is the action plan and assessment, one of our favorite words in academia right now, as you can tell. Uh, this deals with the effectiveness. Did the plan really uh, work effectively? So again, the idea is to consider the problem first, then we teach the associated concepts. I'd like to provide an example uh, from a courts class uh, dealing in particular with sentencing issues. In the past, when I've taught sentencing, it's generally taken the form of a series of lectures about different sentencing alternatives, whether uh, structured sentencing models with sentencing guidelines, three strikes models, and so forth. I find that students in class would understand the concept, but when it came time to the test, they would have some trouble really identifying which model was which, and it was clear that they weren't really seeing the concept of sentencing as clearly as I would have liked them to. So I decided to utilize a problem-based approach. In the problem-based approach, I gave the students a series of hypothetical sentencing cases. I usually give three or four cases, and the students have to prepare a paper, and in class we also discuss what they think the sentence should be in each of those cases. Uh, in each, I give basic background information about the offense and also about the offender. So the students have that, but they haven't yet received any instruction on how sentencing actually works in American judicial systems. But in the course of discussion, after we've talked about what students think the sentence should be, we talk about why, what factors led them to identify the sentence they believe was most appropriate. In addition, 
at the conclusion of that, I provide the actual answers based on sentencing schemes like mandatory minimums, like three strikes, like sentencing guidelines, so that when we look at a case, I can hear and the students can hear what their colleagues think the sentence ought to be, and then we talk about how sentencing theory would actually apply if that were a real case in the jurisdiction that we're studying. At the conclusion of that, we can discuss the various sentencing structures, the pros and the cons of each type of sentencing, and I find that students come out of it with a much deeper understanding of the way sentencing works in our criminal court system. This illustrates problem-based learning because we start with the problem. The problem is what sentence should each offender get. We work through the problem, and then at the end, we tie it into the actual theoretical perspectives about sentencing. But that comes after students have worked through it on their own and can truly make the connections between the theoretical ideas and how they apply to a particular case. Stephen, this is Tony. I just wanted to ask... Correct. I just wanted to ask real quickly, Stephen, I'm sorry, this is Tony. Are you uh, having technical difficulties with your PowerPoint right now? Um, it sh it's showing up okay on my screen. Okay. We're not receiving anything. Yeah, we're not receiving anything right now. The last screen we have is the how can it be done, the brief problem-solving scenarios. Um, let me try again here. Can you hear my voice? Okay. Yeah, oh, yes. your voice is fine. Yeah, I mean, right now I'm showing the, uh, the screen about corrections. We don't have it. Well, what I okay. would just recommend, and I'm sorry for everyone on the line, uh, sometimes these technical difficulties happen. Would it be possible, Steve, for you to, to shut down your just your PowerPoint and try reopening it and move to the correction yeah. screen? Mm -hmm. In the meantime, if I could sing, I would, you know, just for a little bit of entertainment value. Sorry, nobody wants to hear that. Is it showing up now? No. Yeah. How about now? Now it's showing okay. up. Okay. Okay. All right. So, uh, moving to corrections, uh, another area where I found problem-based learning to be successful is in talking about probation and community-based corrections. Again, in the past, I used to give a lecture explaining here's how probation works, here's what probation officers do, here's how people on probation um, go through the probation system, but found that students, again, didn't always grasp that as fully as I would have liked. So in class, as an example of a role-playing exercise, I developed a probation simulation where students over the course of several days role-played probation officers. They were given a series of cases that were assigned to them as a hypothetical probation officer, and for each of those cases they had to complete a risk and needs assessment on the client, had to develop a supervision plan for the client, and in some cases I would give them additional information that occasionally required them to make a revocation decision based on a client. So they were working through using the same concepts, in fact, even using the same paperwork that probation officers in practice use. And from that, in groups, we were able to identify what are the lessons learned for probation and what factors influence the use of probation or discretion in probation systems. From this, we could extrapolate lessons learned and it really helps students to unpack and unmask the correctional alternative of probation which on the surface, of course, sounds simple and straightforward to them, but through this exercise, we were able to get into the theoretical literature and theoretical ideas about what actually drives probation decisions. Again, it's problem-based in that they start with the scenario working through it, and then we develop the theoretical understandings 
that come out of that process. And another way of doing uh, problem-based learning is through case study. If you <laughs> use a criminological theory uh, example, it's an actual case, uh, and it's uh, about a serial killer, Carl Pandram. And the students are provided with a variety of details, although not all the details that uh, I'm going to provide you with uh, right now. But here, here's something about the, this, uh, the serial killer. And this looks like you know, the, you know, the early uh, 1900s. Here's a guy who was really grew up poor, impoverished immigrant in a household in Minnesota. He lacked any parental attention, but when he did get attention, it was physical punishment. His first arrest was when he was eight years old for drunk and disorderly conduct, if you can imagine that. He was in reform school for robbery by the age of 11. He was sexually and physically used at reform school, and he decided he was going to retaliate by setting fire to the reform school. At 14, he also set fire to a warehouse, as he called it in his, uh, I guess, diary, just for fun. At 16, he joined the Army and was later dishonorably discharged. And of course, as he was in the military, he had served prison, uh, military prison time. So he was in and out of prison uh, for a series of burglaries. And he started this hatred, started to turn toward himself. And he turned it to a serial killer. And he traveled around the world in search of victims. And he says, and I quote, uh, in my lifetime, I have murdered 21 human beings. I have committed thousands of burglaries, robberies, larcenies, and arsons, and committed sodomy on more than a 1,000 people. For these things, I'm not a least bit sorry. Of course, he's always available for kiddie parties if he wants. Um, but when he was in prison, he killed a prison staff member and received the, the death sentence. So again, we're asking the students uh, to kind of list the factors. What, what caused him, what do you think influenced his uh, criminal activity? And what factors could have led someone to a life of crime? And then we go, uh, what could we do as a society to maybe focus on those, uh, those factors, what, what we can do, and then what we, at the end of all of this, now we connect it to criminological theory. So instead of starting with the crim, uh, criminological theory and then give a case, we start with the case and let the students work through this problem, and they've kind of created where they'll find where the criminological theory now exists. Another uh, case study of, uh, approach would be from, from the legal aspect. And you tend to use the case, a really neat case, and it was decided in the uh, year 2000. It's called Stowe versus Minor Bill. Uh, and I'll tell you, the facts of the case here, here's a police officer observes a vehicle in a parking lot with the lights off at this uh, beer distributing center. And it's important to note that this this area had some recent burglaries. So the officer finds the vehicle. He thinks it's suspicious. He approaches it and finds two males, an 18-year-old and a 17-year-old juvenile. Also important to note that the, the officer uh, did not see any signs of burglary at this establishment. But the investigation did reveal that both of these young men had been drinking. And when they were questioned, they were really evasive in their uh, answers to the officer. But a legal search revealed two condoms. So the officer questioned the youth as to their sexual activity. The, uh, the officer testified that both of these uh, young men acknowledged they were gay and engaging in consensual sexual activity. So also, it's important to note that no law uh, prohibited consensual same-sex activity, and both were of legal age in their jurisdiction to do so. So at least in this area, that was the case. However, they were still juveniles, so they were arrested for underage alcohol and brought back to the police station. At the station, the officer lectured them on the Bible and morality, and he counseled them against homosexual activity. The officer told the 18-year-old that if he didn't inform his grandfather that he was gay, the officer would do it for him. See, I guess in a small town, you know, you Everyone kind of knew one another, and the officer knew the grandfather. Well, shortly afterward, 
the 18 year old told his friend that he was with, he said, if he tells my grandfather, I'm going to commit suicide. Sure enough, the officer did, and the 18 year old committed suicide. And the ultimate ruling by the third uh, circuit court of appeals found that the right of privacy of those young men were violated. But, you know, getting back, getting back to this, it's, uh, it's important to note that the discussion occurs actually before the students get the ruling. So the students have to decide what uh, the officer did, was it appropriate or not. And this gets into a whole uh, discussion on theoretical ideas about what is, what is privacy, should a person have a right to privacy, and what are the concepts of law as it relates to morality. So when we think about problem-based learning, again, the model is one that promotes very active, very engaging learning experiences in which students are initially presented with a role play, with a case study, or with a problem-based scenario that they are challenged to resolve. And upon resolving it, subsequent discussion with the instructor leads to the inductive development of theoretical principles about the concept. In looking at the benefits of problem-based learning, research has found that there are a number that indeed may provide for numerous learning benefits for students. First deals with what we might call the net generation or what we might call the millennial generation and what resonates most clearly with those students. There's a lot that can be said about millennial students, some negative, some positive. But one positive attribute of the generation is that they enjoy and appreciate opportunities to work in teams to resolve realistic problems. That's not to say that all education must cater to exactly what students want, but sometimes students know best about pedagogical ideas. And in this case, their desire to grapple with and resolve problems does resonate and provides a benefit for their learning. Problem-based learning can also promote lifelong learning because really it's going beyond simply teaching students substantive knowledge. While students do receive substantive knowledge as a result of problem-based learning, they're also discovering how to solve problems, how to work together, how to be collegial, how to approach an unknown and reach a resolution about it which is certainly a professional skill, but also a life skill that can serve them in a number of other endeavors. Problem-based learning promotes an appreciation of complexity. Sometimes students may find frustrating that a case doesn't have a clear right or wrong answer. That's particularly true for freshman and sophomore level students we've found. But going through the problem-based learning process can help them identify that there is a lot of complexity in this world and can help them understand how to cope with it and how to address it when they have those problems that don't have a clear black and white answer. As the name suggests, problem-based learning certainly helps develop problem solving and other critical thinking skills that are so highly valued and applicable. Research has found that it promotes retention of knowledge. And again, to go back to where we began, the fact that medical schools have adopted this because they find that it better retains information among uh, future doctors, I think is a very powerful sentiment. And research in other disciplines has also found that the retention of information is better under this model. And finally, by giving problems and challenges that are messy, that are real world, that are directly related to the fields that students are studying in hopes of acquiring a profession, problem-based learning can help them develop those professional and career-relevant skills that will make them a better practitioner of justice and that will also help them when it's time to go out on the job interview. We've heard from any number of our former students who have gone through problem-based learning courses that when they get to that interview stage, instead of just being able to talk about, here's what I know and here's what classes I took, they're able to describe situations which, while hypothetical and while classroom-based, have real-world analogs in which they can say, I've dealt with situations of this sort and have some experience working through 
the kinds of tasks that I'll be asked to in a career setting. So we found numerous benefits for problem-based learning that have been supported in the literature. Well, before we get to your questions or comments, this is just a uh, question that we would like to pose to you. Something for you to think about is, is there any way possible, if you're not already doing it, to integrate problem-based learning into your curriculum? So, you know, as Steve has mentioned, originated in the medical field to train future physicians, really the basic premise of problem-based learning is that learning should be a constructive and active process. Therefore, really, the role of the instructor is not one of providing direct instruction through traditional based formats, but rather it's one of facilitating student learning, as even I believe, through innovative, challenging, and collaborative problem-solving exercises. As you could probably already tell, this is going to require careful and intentional efforts in course preparation, but we absolutely believe that this, the rewards for students are going to be amazing, and the rewards for faculty will also really benefit the classroom and even outside the classroom as well. So we thank you. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate that. Um, at this point, this would be a great time if any of the attendees have any questions, we'd be happy to uh, present them both to both Stephen and Todd. I'm getting a list of questions right now, so hold on one second. Um, Tom Jordan asks, do you use this approach for an entire course? or is it sprinkled into a traditional course? Okay, Steve, let me uh, just mention uh, that this is Todd speaking. Uh, that's a great question, and it, could, it can go either way. You can have a whole course designed in problem-based learning, or you can take certain sections of a course and say, for this section, I want to do problem-based learning. So we think it could work either way. Yeah, my my uh, anecdotal experience, uh, for what it's worth, has been that in the freshman and sophomore level courses, I tend to use it uh, periodically as an assignment every so often that's a problem-based assignment that then builds to what we're going to talk about. In junior and senior level classes, uh, that's where I would be more likely to incorporate it uh, fully across the course. And I say that because it, it, it takes time to develop, for students, to develop the kinds of skills to grapple with these problems. So if they're introduced to it in a lower level course and then more fully are able to engage in a higher level course, then that's scaffolding the experience in, in a way that helps them become acclimated and become successful in, as, as problem solvers. And I agree. I agree with Steve. I think doing it in an intro level course in some of your you know, freshman, sophomore level courses where you, you can introduce them to the, the case study approach, you can introduce them to problem-based learning in a different aspect of it. That's super. I know in, my, in the capstone course, uh, I, I kind of develop a whole course around problem-based learning. We have another question from Jared Leinbach. hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Is this a strategy you utilize only in the traditional classroom, or do you also use it in an online course? Well, I, I can take that one. I've, I've, taught, a number, uh, I've taught a number of online and face-to-face -face courses um, here at Radford. I find that it works really well in the online environment. And I, I say that because now I, I know there are many different models of online education. For me, I'm usually teaching an online class of 15 to 25 people and making extensive use of discussion boards uh, as part of that. And I found that uh, problem-based learning can be really useful in discussion board posts to motivate uh, understandings of the issues that we're ultimately going to talk about. So whether it's an introductory discussion board post at the beginning of a module that then builds to the technical understanding, or whether it's the primary focus of a module to build to that understanding. I found that it's useful 
uh, in, in that venue. Wonderful. We have another question from Mark Marcellese. Again, I hope I uh, pronounced your last name correctly. Have either of the two presenters taken two sections of the same course and presented one section with traditional approach and the other with the problem-solving approach? If so, what were the results? Um, again, this is Todd. Mark, I, I have not done that. Uh, probably for sheer laziness on my part uh, that when I'm teaching a course for a semester uh, that I want to be consistent throughout that entire uh, semester. So I have not done that. Uh, I have done it by semester, but I have not done it where I teach uh, like a 9 o'clock class one way and then the 11 o'clock class another way. That could be interesting though. Yeah, and I've, I've not done that either, but um, what I have done is uh, taught a class in a very traditional model and then moved to a more problem-based model in the same course in subsequent semesters. And in, in doing that, I've seen, uh, I've seen improvement in student understanding, improvement in overall um, uh, performance on the various assignments within the class, and also a lot more vibrant engagement. Uh, within the class, and so it's not it's not one to one in the same semester, but um, almost as an interrupted time series, I suppose it um, it it has seemed to make a positive difference. And of course, we know that there's so many other factors that go into uh, engaging the students, including the the time the class needs, class size, class location. The whole, I mean, what works in a a 9 o'clock class may not work in a 1 o'clock class and vice versa, but I still think that's a really neat approach to, to take just to see if you can see it, uh, an instant difference uh, between the two classes. Um, Tom has a follow-up question. He says, uh, the way the examples were explained, it did not sound as if the students had to gain any course knowledge about the problem until the prof provided it at the, quote, end, end quote, of the problem slash scenario. Is that correct, or do students actually read and research in the course material to solve or respond? I'll take that. Um, you could do it either way. The richest experience is if students do their own research and do their own discovery uh, while they're grappling with the problem. In other words, uh, the idea is not for students to be presented with a problem and then say, okay, whatever you think, and we're all good, and now here's the theory. The richer experience is for students to be given a problem, and then either with resources suggested by the instructor or with uh, pointing students in the right direction for the kinds of resources to get, or just telling them you have to find something, having students provide arguments to resolve the problem that are evidence-based, that are uh, that are grounded in something other than just opinion, because then that's what you can really pull out when it's time to tie the theoretical strings together at the end. So it's, it's not intended to suggest that the problem resolution process is devoid of substance and it's just kind of thrown on at the end. Uh, it's very much meant to be a process in which students are empowered to do their own discovery, and then the results of that discovery are synthesized by the instructor. Uh, and maybe that's the better way to think about it, that the instructor's role is to synthesize it into the theoretical frameworks to help it all make sense and to pull it together in that cohesive way at the end. Yeah, it moves them beyond the I believe, I feel stages. So, yeah, well put, Steve. Anything else, Tony? I'm here. Hello. Uh, Tom okay. has another question. Uh, Tom suggested that uh, one of the biggest hurdles he's experienced is students being 
too busy to do the work re required for problem-based learning. How do you overcome that? Well, um, that that can be that can be a tough one. Um, everything, uh, from my perspective, and, and Todd may have a different approach to this, but from my perspective, everything that goes into problem-based learning is assessed. Uh, so students don't get a free pass to just um, to just discuss and turn in a thought paper that doesn't have some assessment component to it. So students are held accountable for the work that they do and are held accountable for the quality of the work that they do and, and that provides an external motivation that I've found helps. I, I have tried it before where it's less grading and more discussion oriented but I, I find that they need at least some measure of grading to help motivate them. Uh, in terms of time commitment, um, you know, I, there, there are some cases where I'll give class time depending on how extensive something is. I mean, if it's really extensive and needs a lot of time to process, and especially if it's a group-based, uh, problem-based learning effort, uh, sometimes I'll give a piece of class time to students to help them do that to at least get them started so I can overhear what they're saying and provide guidance um, if they need it. Um, but I, I also, you know, I, I tend to structure my classes around a very, uh, a, a fairly strict model of professionalism, and I, I make clear to the students from day one that if, if you're going to succeed in this class, here are the professional expectations that you have. And I've really started challenging students to look at my class not as a class, but as a workplace where they're performing tasks that they're delivering to me, the boss, and to treat it as that kind of an environment rather than a course-based environment. And when I've done that and coupled it with assignments of this type, um, that seems to help, again, as an extrinsic motivator. Um, but I know that, I, I do know that that is a challenge that's sometimes difficult for students to, to overcome. Yeah, and I haven't found so much of them being, I have, I have too much else to do or I'm too busy, I don't have time for this, because this is one of the things they get so excited about because it's an engagement process. They're, not, they're no longer passive learners just sitting there taking in information. They're actually working out a problem. At the same time, I've also found this to be really good uh, if you have a time slot, uh, an evening class, for example, where you have a three-hour block of class, this really, the problem-based learning approach is really good for that, especially when you break them down into groups. So if you have that luxury, that's fine. But I also see, I've seen it work so well in the uh, regular class period of time. And I agree with Steve. It is a matter of professionalism and, and setting the standard up front that uh, you know, everyone is busy and you know we're gonna we're gonna get through work through this together, but this is how you know, problems are solved in the real world. We have time for one more question. If anybody else has a question, okay. And we have one last question from Mark. It appears that a criminal justice program and its associated faculty would have to adopt a problem-based approach to the program if this is to be very successful. This is a challenge for the faculty, especially in a program that is independent contractor-based. Setting the standard for the students may be easier than setting the standard for the faculty. <laughs> well, <laughs> Steve, you're the chair. I'll let you answer that one. <laughs> I, I, I would agree that uh, setting the standards for students is easier than setting them for the faculty. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, I, I, you know, and I, I would suggest that uh, I, I don't think that as a department here we all, we all use this approach. Um, there, there are, we, we all do a variety of things beyond a traditional lecture exam format, but uh, there are a number of different things faculty do. I have found it to be successful in an isolated course. I think the power is multiplied when multiple faculty use it, particularly when it progresses from 
the freshman year through the senior year. Um, but I, I, I do think there is value in an individual course because, again, it's whatever we can do in that course to help students engage with uh, and retain the material and to really critically process it. I, I do know that, uh, well, one, one flexibility that we have at Radford, and I know this is not true at every institution, is that our faculty have a, tr a tremendous amount of autonomy in how to schedule uh, how to schedule their courses and how to um, how to structure their courses. So we don't have a common text for each course. We don't have a common set of assessment measures for each course. Uh, it's it's very flexible on the part of the faculty, and I and I would say that 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 is key to to being able to do this. In situations where there's less of that flexibility or where the entire department is not engaged with this kind of process, I think there's still opportunities to infuse it uh, in, in assignments and so forth, but um, it, it would be a little bit more challenging if there were strict limits as to what could be done. Yeah, Mark, let me just add to this. I, I, you know, while I'm a fan of problem-based learning, I don't think it's for every course and nor is it for every instructor. So I don't think it's necessarily program specific, but it might be course specific. That helps. And I just want to yeah. mention to both you and, yeah, you and Stephen that uh, Mark said he looks forward to integrating this into his, his course and to working with his colleagues uh, along with, with this problem-based learning. So he wa wanted to say thank you for the feedback. Fantastic. Thanks. Absolutely. And, um, what I would like to do at this point is, is end the discussion, unless I, any other questions come up in the next minute or so. I did want to thank everyone for joining us today on this webinar. Especially want to thank both uh, Stephen and Todd for taking time out of their schedules to present this webinar to us. On another note, we will be uh, providing a recording of this presentation up on YouTube if you're interested in watching the session again. We will be sending an email out to each one of you who attended the presentation with the access so you can uh, re-watch the YouTube presentation um, at a later date. We hope to have this up in, on our YouTube site um, within the next five to seven business days. Um, and everybody has been very polite here, Stephen and Todd. There's many people that have said thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks for the feedback. And uh, once again, I want to do that as well on, on the behalf of Oxford University Press. Thank you, Stephen and Todd, for uh, taking time to, uh, to share your thoughts with us today. It's our pleasure. Happy to do so. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Again, we will be sending out information to where you will be able to uh, once again, review this webinar on our YouTube channel. We appreciate your time and attention today. And uh, thank you so much. We hope you all have a great weekend. Take care and goodbye.